Laidlaw was walking up Dunbull Street towards the station. Harkness had had Laidlaw pointed out to him, although they had never met. He recognised the deceptively tall figure, deceptive because the width of the shoulders acted against the height, making him seem smaller than he was. The most striking thing about him was something Harkness had noticed every time he had seen him, preoccupation. He never came on him empty. In 1977, a Glasgow school teacher, the son of an Ayrshire coal miner, published a novel about a detective inspector called Jack Laidlaw. He was drinking too much, not for pleasure, just sipping it systematically, like low-proof hemlock. His marriage was a maze nobody had ever mapped, an infinity of habit and hurt and betrayal. He was a policeman, a detective inspector, and more and more he wondered how that had happened. Laidlaw was the work of William McIlvanny. What he'd created was a fictional character who lived in a very real world, a cop with a deadpan wit who read philosophy and navigated the ruined landscapes and ruined lives of a post-industrial Scotland. Well, think of it this way, Laidlaw said. There are tourists and travellers. Tourists spend their lives doing a cook's tour of their own reality, ignoring their slums. Travellers make the journey more slowly, in greater detail, mix with the natives. A lot of murderers are, among other things, travellers. They've become terrifyingly real for themselves. Their lives are no longer a hobby, poor bastards. To come at them, you've got to become a traveller too. In his own way, William McIlvanny had decided to become a traveller, into a world of crime, to use his writing and his weary detective to expose the hard truths of modern Scottish society, to show the people and the places that books had long ignored. Laidlaw was a game changer in Scottish literature, and over the past four decades, it's inspired a whole generation of fellow travellers. In this film, we're exploring how Scottish crime writing has evolved to become a global phenomenon. We're talking to some of the authors whose work has made it so distinctive, and hearing how their latest books are continuing to push the possibilities of what the crime novel can be. We begin by going back to Laidlaw's time, to the Glasgow of the late 1970s. In our new book, Val McDermott draws on her own experiences as a rookie reporter, a woman in a Neanderthal's world, to unfurl a tale of political intrigue and violence set against the bleak backdrop of the winter of discontent. Fat flakes blew into his face, cold wet kisses on his cheeks and eyelids. Last time there had been a winter like this, he'd been a wee boy, and all he remembered was the fun. Sledging down the big hill, throwing snowballs in the playground, sliding across the frozen lake in the park. Now it was a pain in the arse. Driving was a nightmare of slush and black ice. Walking was worse. But there were advantages. No one would ever know he'd been here. His footprints would be erased within the hour. There was nobody else on the street. He felt like the last man standing. I think one of the reasons that I, I chose to, to start this sequence in 1979 was that this was quite early on in my career as a journalist and I've had a lot of uh, requests, pressure, whatever, from my publishers in recent years to write a memoir or to write an autobiography and I really don't want to do that um, because, frankly, if it was going to be in any way honest, an awful lot of people would have to die before I could escape the libel laws. So, And, and I didn't really want to do that. I don't, I, you know, I don't think that my personal take on the world is that interesting necessarily, or the events of my life are that interesting. So, But I wanted to draw on my experience, and this seemed to me to be a way of writing about the times that I have lived through and the changes I've observed and the way I feel about those changes as they happened without it being all about me. Ali Burns, the heroine of 1979, is not me, but the anecdotage is mine. <laughs> I suppose there's several writers I would I would point to as having inspired different aspects of my work. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson, I think, of course, with, with Jekyll and Hyde, uh, but also with Treasure Island, which remains sort of my desert island book. But also uh, one of the seminal works was William McIlvanny's Laidlaw, which was the first time I had read any novel that was written in, in, in a modern Scottish working-class voice. 
And the fact that it was also a crime novel just I thought was amazing uh, and really made me understand what was possible to do with the crime novel, that it was possible for it not just to be a whodunit, but for it also to be a novel that reflected the way we live now. The crime novel is, is, is a perfect vehicle for writing a novel of social history, if you like, uh, not least because within the confines of the crime novel, you're not restricted or constricted to one tiny social group of people. Uh, you've got a whole range of possible characters and, and social strata. Because you've got you've got the victim and their friends and relatives and workmates and family, and they've got you've got the the, the detective, you've got the media who could be covering the case, and you've got the forensic scientists who are all involved. So you can draw on every aspect of life at once, almost, in the same novel without straining at it, or you can drill down into one corner of society. And I think that uh, at a time when people are, are asking what it means to be Scottish, this is the perfect place for writers to, to explore that idea. One of the most powerful and enduring features of Scottish crime writing is its ability to hold up a mirror to society, which is exactly what Denise Miner is doing with her latest novel, except in this case, it's the society of 400 years ago. All the same in retelling one of Scottish history's bloodiest murders for a modern audience, Denise reveals how the fallout from one crazy, drunken, lost weekend in 16th century Edinburgh can still resonate right up to the present day. Mary Queen of Scots is six months pregnant, warm and young. She's hosting a supper party for her friends in a small turret room on the second floor of the James V Tower, just off her bedroom. Edinburgh's cold, but spring flickers at the corner of the eyes. The light has started to change. Grey is giving way to blue, the days are longer, the rain feels less spiteful. The hint of renewal is echoed in Mary's body. Her breasts are full, her cheeks are flushed with extra blood, her long, slim body is slowly forming into an S. New life is coming. She doesn't know that right now, half the nobles of Scotland are downstairs silently storming her palace. They are skittering around in the dark, 200 of them, crowding the entrances and overwhelming the guards. They've already confiscated all the keys and secured the gate. No one in the supper room hears anything. Retelling histories like Rizzio's murder, um, I think that's absolutely essential. And I'm sure we will be rewritten uh, but there are so many aspects of history that are not told, that have never been um, examined. People know Rizzio was murdered, but they don't really understand a lot of the aspects of that. They don't really know that it was um, uh, almost the entire upper class of Scotland conspired to kill this servant and had signed contracts about who was going to get what once this was done. And I think, you know, there are so many aspects of Scottish history that get forgotten. We know about the men killing each other and people enforcing their will on other people. What I'm interested in is the spaces between those stories and the not just the feminine narratives and the narratives of working class people and people of colour, but actually, you know, just all the missed out bits, there are so many stories in them. I just think we need to start unpacking history and get beyond the kilts and the blue faces and the Mel Gibson statues. When I'm researching a book, what I really love to do is go to the place and get a sense of the geography of everything. You know, if you're a writer and someone says, write 700 pages of anything, that's absolutely paralyzing. But if someone says, you, it's got to be in this small room, you're only allowed this number of people, there has to be a cat there and you've got two paragraphs, that's really interesting. And it makes it really come alive if you have an image in your head of what happened and you go to the site of the place that it happened. Um, it really makes it. I was, when I'm writing fiction books, I always try and find the house the person lives in. And I always try and work out what the latest shop is. So, you know, the, oh, like there's 15 minutes from a garage or there's, a, do you know what I mean? There's like a 24 hour shop there or, because um, uh, it just gives you a sense of how somebody lives. So I think that's dead important. So often in Scotland's crime fiction, it's not just the people that are the key characters, but the places that they inhabit too. Tenements, closes, streets, buildings, even whole cities or landscapes are alive with personality. In the novels of Ambrose Parry, pen name of the husband and wife writing team of Chris Brookmeyer and Marissa Hatesman, the stark divides and labyrinthine warrens of Victorian Edinburgh 
are silent accomplices to lies, secrets and murder. The old town had its share of desirable places to stay. It was built bridge upon bridge, layer upon layer. But the further you descended from its airy heights, the worse it became. Sarah had walked past many dark alleyways in her way here, concerned about what or who might be lurking within. Dixon's Close was a narrow lane, the, the buildings, buildings four stories high on either side. side. The, the sun, sun briefly breaking. broke through the clouds overhead, illuminating small sections of the passageway and making it seem momentarily less foreboding. Then it darkened again. Sarah took a deep breath and proceeded into the close. Well, it all really started when I, I went back to university to do a master's degree in the history of medicine. And because I was an anaesthetist, I was interested in the early use of chloroform and ether in Edinburgh in the mid 19th century. And so I started reading about James Young Simpson and the more I read, the more interesting he became as a character. And when I spoke to Chris about some of the things I had read, he became quite excited and said that he was convinced that there was probably a novel in this somewhere. To me, what makes Edinburgh particularly attractive for crime fiction is that when you go there, it's all kind of as was. You, you can picture those characters, you can picture those scenes. It's not like when you visit uh, another city you've read about in historical fiction, you get there and it's now all glass and concrete. Edinburgh is still very much the same, and a lot of uh, Edinburgh's divides and social quirks have endured despite the changes of the centuries. In terms of researching the, the layout of the city, there's a fantastic resource in that the National Library of Scotland has all these maps online. So, for instance, when we were writing The Way of All Flesh, I, I had lived for several years just off Leith Walk, so when I looked at Leith Walk in 1847, it struck me that it was a, a road leading down to Leith, but there wasn't the same urbanisation. So a lot of it would have been just fields and darkness, and that changed what could take place there. That made a walk back up in, at night time something far more perilous. You're always inspired by um, the the possibilities of spaces, but a space that you're familiar with when you get a sense of how it was 150 years ago, that's, that's hugely exciting. It was this possibility of space that was at the heart of Graham McCrae Burnett's remarkable Booker shortlisted novel, His Bloody Project. Set in a tiny community in the Scottish Highlands in the late 19th century, it shows how even the wildest, wide open spaces of the remote north can press in around you leading some towards madness, or even murder. Mr Sinclair has asked that I set out what he calls the chain of events which led to the killing of Lachlan Broad. I've thought carefully about what the first link in this chain might be. One might say that it began with my own birth, or even further back, when my parents met or married, or with the sinking of the two Ians which brought them together. However, while it is true to say that if any of these events had not occurred, Lachlan Broad would be alive today, or at least would not have died by my hand, it is still possible to conceive that things might have taken a different course. When I'm writing something set in the past, I, I'm not at all thinking about whether it will resonate in a contemporary way. Um, in particular with his bloody project, what's been so fascinating to me when the book has travelled around the world and been translated into different languages to find a response from readers from different countries and readers in China, in Australia, in Russia, all making parallels with historical situations in their own countries or even contemporary situations. And so without any intention on my part, it does resonate. And I think that's one of the amazing things that a book can do. The setting of his bloody project, Kaldui, a tiny hamlet in West Ross, is, is very, very important. And I think of setting almost as a character. So the, the characters, the, the human characters of the book, um, interact with the setting. So Roddy McRae would be a completely different person if he'd been born and brought up in Glasgow. It can be strikingly beautiful, but these are also very barren and rather fearsome places. And I think back in the 19th century, people would have this tremendous feeling of isolation and claustrophobia, and I, that was very important to me in writing the book. Uh, being shortlisted for the Booker Prize changed my life. It changed my life as a writer um, overnight. 
suddenly my book was selling. I was able to earn a living as a writer. Um, and my books are now published, you know, in you know, 20 languages, which is incredible. It's a major thing, I think, for a writer, especially given that at the time I was not well known. Um, so it really catapulted me into a spotlight I hadn't been in before. One of the most remarkable things about crime writing is its ability to cross the widest, most diverse cultural boundaries. At the same time, it offers the ideal form to explore what happens and where the truth lies when different cultures meet. In his award-winning series of novels, Abir Mukherjee takes readers into the dark and often deadly underbelly of melting pot Calcutta in the last days of the British Raj. At least he was well dressed. Black tie, tux, the works. If you're gonna get yourself killed, you may as well look your best. I coughed as the stench clawed at my throat. In a few hours, the smell would be unbearable, strong enough to turn the stomach of a Calcutta fishmonger. I pulled out a packet of capstans, tapped out a cigarette, lit it and inhaled, letting the sweet smoke purge my lungs. Death smells worse in the tropics. Most things do. When we talk about the cultures in Calcutta, um, I think of Calcutta as very much like Glasgow. They were both called the second city of the empire. They both owe their, their wealth and their heyday to empire and trade and the influx of so many different cultures and peoples from all around the world. Like Glasgow, Calcutta saw an influx of people, not just from Britain uh, or Europe, but from China and Africa. Uh, and those people left their influences, not only in the, the people that stayed there, but the cuisine, the culture, the, the literature of the place is all tinged by this, influ this confluence of people. And that, that helps to, to widen horizons. And I think when you widen horizons, you, you improve the literary landscape. I became a crime writer, I think, um, mainly because I loved reading crime, uh, but also because I grew up in Scotland where I think we took the crime novel uh, from something which was merely entertainment and turned it into something that was entertainment plus social commentary. And that's what I loved about it, the fact that you could look at serious issues while telling a riveting story. Uh, and that's what appealed to me. My parents were from India. I was raised in Scotland, uh, born in London for my sins. Um, and I found that when I was growing up, we didn't learn about British colonial history. We didn't talk about this time that the British spent in India. And I found that I would learn something. And, and, and a lot of the time, my parents would tell me something. And I would get a different interpretation from, you know, British sources. So really, it was a search for what was the truth and a search for my own identity. When I started writing, there were very few novels that I could think of, or very few writers who were exploring um, India uh, in, in the crime genre. And, and certainly nobody was looking at the British period in India. And so you might say that um, uh, I had, there was a gap in the market, uh, and I was the first one to fill it. Back in 1985, an aspiring writer met William McIlvanny at the Edinburgh Book Festival. He told them that he wanted to write the Edinburgh Laid Law. That Edinburgh Laid Law became John Rebus, and the aspiring writer was Ian Rankin. Three and a half decades later, and Ian himself has now become the voice of Laid Law. Working from an unfinished McIlvanny manuscript, he's produced a new Laid Law novel, The Dark Remains. In a sense, it brings the story of Scottish crime writing full circle. Ian has said if it hadn't been for Laidlaw, he might never even have become a crime writer. It was McIlvanny who first inspired him to use the form to explore the chaotic modern world around him. Well, I mean, I wrote the first Rebus novel because I was trying to make sense of Edinburgh. I'd always written, as a kid, I'd written to try and make sense of the world, to recreate the world, to play God, to make things happen the way I wanted them to happen in a way that wasn't possible in the real world. So it's a lot of kind of therapy and a lot of wish fulfilment about it. And I was in Edinburgh, I'd arrived here 78 as a student, couldn't make head nor tail of the place. Big, it seemed to me a big chaotic mechanism. And to make sense of it, I started writing about it. And Rebus, like me, is an outsider. He grew up in Fife, he came here at some point in his life, and he's still an outsider and he's still trying to make sense of the place. And Edinburgh was a city that on the surface seemed cultured and civilised and lots of tourists came here and they saw the castle, they saw the Scott Monument, then they went away again. 
But there were all these social problems in the 80s that they weren't seeing. There was this other Edinburgh hidden just below the surface, which eventually Irvin Welsh would talk about in Trainspotting, for example. But nobody seemed to be discussing it in fiction at that time, the late 70s, early 80s. So I thought, well, if nobody else is doing it, I'll do it. Glasgow's got Marco Vanni, it's got James Kelman had just come along, but Edinburgh seemed to miss Jean Brodie, miss Jean Brodie and some poets and playwrights. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write contemporary fiction set in Edinburgh, and it's going to be crime fiction, because crime is a great way of looking at society. Detective is a great way of investigating the world. He has an access all areas pass to the haves and the half nots, the overworld and the underworld. So it just all made sense. I mean, Edinburgh suits itself very well to crime fiction because it is a city of great wealth and great poverty. Structurally, it's a city that's divided. The new town and the old town, the rational and the irrational. And that's what happens in Jekyll and Hyde. You take a very rational, scientific man and you suddenly allow his irrational side, his Hyde, to emerge. So Edinburgh's got that. It's got that built into its structure that it is a city of rational and irrational, a city of good and evil, a city of haves and have-nots, a city of light and dark. And uh, I like that. I mean, I like, I like finding those spaces, those little interstices where the, the haves and the have-nots meet, the underworld and the overworld, the Hyde and the Jekyll. That's what I do in all my books. And I find Edinburgh f and endlessly fascinating as a city that seems to sum up the human condition. Summing up the human condition, you could say that this is at the core of what makes crime writing so popular. This desire, this need to work beneath the surface, to uncover what's behind the lies we tell and the secrets we keep, to explore the extremes of personality or circumstance that drive people to commit crimes or even to kill. And is there perhaps something in the water or the air or the landscape that makes Scotland's crime writers so adept at this, so skilled at unpeeling these layers of personality to expose the raw nerve of identity and truth. <laughs>